us these days are filled with uncertainties and fear. There is little about, uh, there is little under our control, whether in the U.S., in Armenia, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Israel, and the West Bank, in Turkey, places that so many of us have personal and professional ties to. One aspect of our lives we can sort of try to regulate is the kind of learning we do. As many scholars involved in the Society for Armenian Studies are historians and or involved with the history of things Armenian, I thought it could be really exciting and instructive for our members to have an opportunity to learn from Professor Adam Gutsuzian, who is the only Armenian American I know of who studies US history with a focus on African American history. Activism can take on many different forms. As historians of an often neglected, ignored, or erased past, we all know that unearthing and sharing silences, silent stories is a specific kind of political activism and one that can offer new and meaningful paths and options for other kinds of political action. It is wonderful to see so many gathered here today to learn from a fellow historian who is also dedicated to the telling of suppressed stories. Thank you, Adam, for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Bedik, for your enthusiasm for this idea. And thank you to all for attending. Um, so basically, Adam, the first question that I have is a very general one, like general series of questions. How did you choose to become a historian? How did you choose to study US history? And how did you end up focusing specifically on African American history? Sure. Uh, so the first question, how did I decide to become a historian? Uh, kind of in, in bits and pieces along the way. It wasn't something that when I was in high school or even in college, thought, well, I didn't think that was a career that I was going to pursue, not by any means. Uh, I graduated from college. I had a degree in history and American studies, uh, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I worked for a mutual fund company. Uh, and the first thing that I established was that I didn't want to work for a mutual fund company. Uh, and it was only then that I realized how much value I had derived uh, from education and from, and from the intellectual world. It was all I'd known up until that point. Uh, and so I thought to pursue it further. I thought I might be a teacher. I got an MA in history. And during my first year, uh, at, I did my MA at UMass Amherst. I was really uh, sort of taken by the, uh, by, the, by the profession and by the subject and thought about pursuing a PhD, and, that, and I ended up pursuing one at Purdue University in, in, in India. So that's how I became a historian. Um, I'd always been interested in American history, that had always been uh, a, a field that, that had drawn me in. Um, and you know, I think part of the natural curiosity for why I would become, a, why would an Armenian American become an African American historian, it's tied into this larger fascination. I think for me, my path was through just a more general interest in American history. Uh, ever since I was young, uh, it, it had been something that, that had drawn me in. Um, and I think for me, looking back on it, I wouldn't have articulated it this way at the time, but looking back, I think being Armenian and being you know, a, a child of immigrants and living in you know, a, a suburb of Boston and, and having one foot in the Armenian world and, and one foot in the larger American world, studying American history was almost like a way to claim an American identity uh, and, and to be comfortable with, with both of those worlds. It made me feel more American, so to speak, I guess. Um, and I, I wouldn't have put it in those terms again, I don't think when I was younger, uh, but, ref but reflecting back, that's kind of how I uh, developed my passion for the subject. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the third part of that equation, why African-American history? It w let me start by saying with that, that I don't think there is one path to follow in that regard. Uh, and I, I actually know two others of our Armenian ancestry who studied African American history in graduate school. Uh, and I asked them about their paths to becoming an African American historian because I was curious. Uh, one is a woman named Lisa Hazir Hazirjian who got a PhD from Duke and, and then left academia. She's a, she's a social activist and her whole life has been social justice activism. Uh, it's, it's all she ever wanted to pursue and the PhD was sort of a bump along the road. Um, and so that was what drove her into, into African-American history. Uh, and for her, I asked her about her Armenian identity. And for her, it wasn't, again, it wasn't something direct that drew her in. Uh, she talked about her father and how she was an, he was an inspiration to her. And he would talk about his stories from the Korean War when he would stand up for black soldiers. Uh, and sort of the, the idea of the Armenian as the underdog was, was sort of ingrained in her a little bit. Uh, but it was very sort of uh, abstruse for her, very abstract. I have another friend named Jean Thea Harris, who's an outstanding historian. She wrote an award-winning book about uh, Rosa Parks. She's half Armenian. Uh, and she comes from this extraordinary family. It's half Greek, half Armenian. Uh, her father was a very accomplished historian who studied the FBI and its surveillance of American citizens. Her sister, uh, Liz Thea Harris, is one of, the, is one of uh, the leaders of what's called the Poor People's Movement. Many, many people know Reverend William Barber, who uh, leads this, this uh, new social justice movement. Uh, Jean's sister is, is another one of these leaders. 
Uh, and for Jean, she said that being Armenian was sort of underneath how she came to history and how she came to African-American history because she always thought there was an official history and then a hidden history underneath that, right? Which I think a lot of Armenians uh, would, 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 would understand and grapple. Uh, that there was the, there was the say, sanctioned history and then the true people's history. And that was her approach to sort of getting at those, you know, those, those hidden transcripts, getting the, uh, those, uh, those underneath the story. For me, it wasn't like that. I didn't come at history explicitly from a social justice angle. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted to study African-American history when I went to graduate school. Uh, for me, I was so interested in American culture and, and, and American popular culture, particularly in sports. Uh, uh, you, you, Bedros mentioned that I wrote the book about Bill Russell. A lot of my sort of research along the way has often revolved around sports. Um, and the longer I studied sports history, the, especially in the 20th century, that is a history that is so intertwined with African-American history that that was my way into African-American history. But the more I studied it, the more I taught it, uh, the more I came to see that African-American history was, for me, the way to write about American history, right? It was, you know, John Hope Franklin, the famous African-American historian, uh, titled his autobiography, A Mirror to America. And that's what I, what I think African-American history could do. It can hold a mirror to America. Uh, you can't really understand the nature of American democracy if you don't mm -hmm. understand African-American history. You can't really understand the, the underpinnings of the American economy if you don't understand uh, African-American history. You can't understand the culture that the United States exports to the world if you don't understand it. So that was my path in. Mm -hmm. There's sort of one last part to that, to that question, I think, and that's just sort of the accidents of, the, of a career of a professional historian. Uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, I didn't anticipate that I would find a job as a specialist in African-American history. I was, first of all, I was just hoping to get a job. Uh, and for my first year out of grad school, I didn't get a job at all. And for the second year, I, uh, I was working as an adjunct living in Boston, where you're teaching part-time courses along the way. And then at the end of my second, or before I was about to start my second year of that, very late, in the job cycle, it was almost July, uh, there, I got a job teaching a one-year position in African-American history at, at Hamilton College in upstate New York. Uh, and it was only because someone had left their position at the very end of the school year, they immediately needed someone. They, they were, there, you know, so I got this job. And if I didn't get that one-year position and get sort of those qualifications in teaching African-American history, I never would have got the job that I, that I have now at the University of Memphis as a specialist in African-American history. They wouldn't consider me qualified for the position. And even the position that I got, I know I was the third choice for the position. They offered it to two other people along the way. So these little accidents of history. So I ended up in a majority black city, teaching mostly African-American students about African-American history. And that's shaped my entire life. That's shaped who I, who I become. Uh, it's shaped the books that Bedros was mentioning, particularly the Down to the Crossroads, uh, which is a book about a civil rights march that goes through Mississippi. I couldn't fathom have, having written that book if I lived somewhere else and did something. Mm -hmm. That's okay. a long your question, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's a great long answer to my question. Um, so actually dovetails very well into the next question I wanted to ask, which was how do you understand and or engage with your own positionality as a white man studying African-American history and teaching African-American history? What is it like to be Adam Gutsuzian teaching this history of civil rights at the University of Memphis? And there's a, another question that's tied to this, which I'm sure lots of people will have questions about later, which is, as an Armenian, do you consider yourself white? How do we understand an Armenian racial identity in the United States? Uh, let me tell someone else's story here first. Uh, so I was telling you about my friend Jean, and we were e you know, emailing back and forth about this idea. And she told me a story of when her, when she was first out of college, she taught uh, in Boston at a school that was, all, she had an entirely black classroom. I think it was junior high or early high school. And early in the, in the school year, one of the students comes up to her shyly and, and asks her what her background is. And she says, oh, I'm half Armenian, half Greek. The student goes back and says, see, I told you she wasn't white. <laughs> um, but my, and my own students are often quite curious, you know, early in the class, right, especially if I'm teaching the big survey of African American history, uh, they ask, they, in the South, they ask, where are you from? And that's how they ask. Um, and so I try to explain, you know, I'll explain uh, that I'm Armenian. And for some, they've never even heard such a word, right? They, they, don't, they don't know what Armenian is. Um, and, and they kind of sometimes will use that as an explanation for why I'm there, that I'm not a normal white person. Uh, all that said, right, in terms of sort of the idea of position, positionality, right, I approach African-American history more or less as a white person, right? Um, I, it is, you know, it is, serves as both as an advantage and a disadvantage in the, in the sense of your ability to, to somewhat detach from the subject, right? Um, for instance, it would be very difficult for me to, to have devoted my life to studying Armenian history, I think, for this very reason, right? It feels, uh, 
raw and personal and, and uh, intense in a way where in African-American history, I can engage in the study of history, but still I have this step back. And that is both a power, but also a, a, a limitation as well. And I, tr and I try to talk about this uh, in the classroom with students. Um, the same thing can happen uh, in, in the course of research and in the course of, uh, particularly in interviews, right? Uh, like for instance, with Down on the Crossroads, I conducted lots of interviews with a lot of, uh, a lot of civil rights veterans, white and black. And, uh, you know, attended a number of oral history conferences where people talk about sort of the different ways in which uh, African-American activists might open up to a white interviewer versus a black interviewer. It's entirely, uh, that can be the case. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something you have to engage with and something you have to be aware of. Uh, but if you're kind of open about it and uh, engage in sort of a respectful dialogue with whether with students or with your historical subjects and try to take everybody on their own terms, then mm -hmm. there's really no other way, right? You, you can't, not be who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned this to Adam earlier today. If you haven't read any of, of his books, you really should, not only because they're really well researched, but because they're beautifully written. I mean, you're obviously you love writing. I mean, you take your, your writing, your craft of writing very seriously. I love having written. <laughs> <laughs> no one loves writing itself. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask about is that, you know, you're, there's such a range in terms of the, the kinds of books that you've written. Um, I mean, there's, there's one, I have several questions about all of the books, but um, one of the questions I have is, you know, oftentimes people cr are critical of history as uniquely being a history of great white men. Mm -hmm. In many respects, your history, your, much of your history is focused on great black men yeah. in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could speak to sort of why you, you, you have chosen these kinds of histories about Bill Russell, about Sidney Poitier, about James Meredith. Um, why, are those, why, why is that kind of history writing appealing to you and what kind of role do you think it, ha it plays in, in American history? Uh, sure, particularly with the first two big books that I wrote, the two biographies, the first of Sidney Poitier and the second on Bill Russell. Um, there, I, I was gra gravitated toward both subjects, not only because of the person, right, because of their, of their personal journey, but also because each was a vehicle to explore larger dimensions of African American history and the industry in which they operated. Uh, so in the case of Sidney Poitier, uh, who was, you know, the only black leading man in Hollywood, essentially in the 1950s and 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, played these very sort of perfect uh, characters, right? They, they were they were handsome. They were dignified. They were restrained. They never got into real sexual relationships with with with, with white women. They uh, always helped out the white co-star, right? They were sort of like white liberal fantasies of what a black person should be. Mm -hmm. um, and so his story, and, and there's a whole sort of personal, you know, he's a man full of turmoil at the same time. Um, but as a historian, his story appealed to me because it was a lens into the different. You know, Hollywood is a way that. Uh, to get at sort of how the popular mind in America was thinking about race. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of backlash to the early Sidney Poitier in the 1950s. It was a too groundbreaking a figure. And then he became this heroic figure in the early 60s as Martin Luther King in the March on Washington. And, and he was sort of the emblem of, of that liberal consensus. Mm -hmm. And then there's a backlash against him from black power radicals and from young college students in the late 60s. So his life was kind of a vehicle uh, for... Mm -hmm for larger American racial attitudes. The, the, the reactions to him were really key in that sense. Um, and there was no female equivalent to Sidney Poitier in the film industry. Mm -hmm. The closest thing would have been a Diane Carroll, uh, but, there but there wasn't a major uh, uh, star in that way. And uh, again, with sports, um, Bill Russell was another sort of tremendous vehicle through which to think about the role of the civil rights movement within sport. Um, he had, uh, where Poitier was sort of hemmed in by his image, Russell was the opposite, that he was continually trying to uh, defy white expectations for what a black athlete could be. Uh, and he had all these incredible bona fides as an athlete because he was the leader of the Boston Celtics who won 11 NBA titles in 13 seasons. Mm -hmm. So he was critical of the racism, not just in larger American society, but within sport itself. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, at that time, no really female athlete who was uh, consistently transcendent throughout the, the 1960s who was African-American. There was a Wilma Rudolph in track, but she sort of shown for a brief period. Um, and in both cases with Poitier and Russell, I was also interested in sort of their, their ideas about manhood and their ideas about masculinity. Mm -hmm. Talked all the time in the language of masculinity and manhood. Um, you know, when Russell talked about uh, his standing up for civil rights, he talked about it in terms of 
uh, I must have my manhood rights, right? Well, the, I wouldn't be a man if I didn't do these things. Mm -hmm. I see there was a chat question about Lena Horne. Lena Horne would have been in an earlier era, 40s and 50s. Uh, and she was, again, just sort of a, kind of like a guest star in movies. Like, you know, there would be a musical performance by her. Uh, she was, in some ways, like Dorothy Dandridge and some, some other uh, African-American female uh, stars of the time. But they weren't consistently leading uh, superstar, uh, celebrity stars in, in, in the way that it was. It's also interesting, right, that both, I mean, both Sidney Poitier and Bill Russell, I mean, are considered superstars. They were born, you know, relative, I mean, they're only six years apart in age, and you published books on them in two consecutive years, 2010 and 2011. How did you keep their life stories separate, and how did you? No, no, no. The Poitier book was my dissertation. So I published ah, Okay, so we worked on it for a while. Okay, okay, okay. That was done in 2004. There were six years in between the two books. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like shocked. I th maybe the information oh, no, no. was wrong that I read. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so I have another question about methodology and your approach. How do you how do you choose the topics of your of your books, and also like methodologically? I mean, th there's there's elements of biography. Uh, there's elements of political history, especially with the the most last your your most recent book, which is again called the Men and the Moment, right? Yeah. Um, there, you, you've written a book about sort of environmental history as well. So um, you seem to be methodologically very comfortable, you know, in different fields of history. So, but, but all of your books seem to be really character driven in a way. Yeah, um, almost, all, almost all of them revolve around characters, either one central character in the case of the Claudia and the Russell books, or in the case of Down at the Crossroads, the book about the Civil Rights March, and particularly in the more recent book that I wrote about the election of 1968. Yes, they're very character driven stories. Uh, I try to write in terms of people, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, I want my reader to identify with the story that I'm carrying them along and the way to do, we gravitate toward people. Think about when you watch a film or when you watch a television mm -hmm. show, uh, what gets you sort of emotionally invested in, in, the, in the larger endeavor is that you in some way attach yourself to the person, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and hope that that comes across in the kind of history that I write. I want them to try like with this recent book that I wrote about the uh, presidential election in 1968, like I thought of it in particularly in terms of an undergraduate student who doesn't know Hubert Humphrey from George Wallace, right? Uh, mm -hmm. No connections to, uh, to this era. Uh, the only way to really get them to think about the politics of that time for me was to get them to try to understand them as men, right? And mm -hmm. these are, elite, you know, they are all elite white men in their late adulthood, uh, all of, you know, uh, wealth and privilege. Um, all, the, all the eight men that I profiled in, the, in that little book. Um, but I hope to show how they're all sort of being pushed by all these larger forces in American history, by the civil rights movement, by Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. by this, just the very end of this emerging women's movement. This, uh, 68 is really the last election where the modern women's movement doesn't have a, a very public open effect upon it in the way that it certainly will in 1972. Um, but you're absolutely right. And my wife teases me about this all the time, about how all my books have men in them, right? Or men, men in the title. Uh, and, but, but manhood is a consistent theme that I'm interested in. So while it might be about different things, Hollywood, sports, politics, to me, there's always, uh, the, to me, there is a, a logical thread that connects them all in terms of time period and in terms of the sort of character-driven approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a, another question for you um, in terms of, uh, you know, Armenian studies is very, very rarely focuses on issues related to race, unless specifically re related to the Armenian genocide, or some brief and more recent work on the racial identity of Armenians in the United States. Um, I'm just curious, like, do you have any suggested, suggested readings for, um, for people that study Armenian history that might be just general introductions to study on race, either in general or in the United States, um, or if, if you would be willing to, st to share those? Um, and then I have some other questions, but do you, do you have any suggestions? Sure. Absolutely. In, in terms of thinking about sort of uh, general books, that would help orient a reader in sort of the study of race and racial policy in, in the United States that might speak to this moment. Uh, I have a colleague, Ibram Kendi, who has, who has become a very well-known figure. Uh, he appears consistently on television and on the lecture circuit. And, and uh, he wrote a book called Stamped from the Beginning. Uh, and the last name is Kendi, K-E-N-D-I. That is a history of racist policy uh, in, in the United States. And while that sounds like an unexciting subject, it is a, actually a, a character-driven story as well. 
mm-hmm. uh, starting in the colonial era and going up to the modern day. And he focuses on a series of compelling figures through which to tell the story. It's a very accessible history. And his main argument is that the, the, the policies that are enacted that are racist in effect grow out of the larger racist attitudes of the time. Uh, which is uh, which is sort of it's sort of, for many it's sort of a chicken or the egg sort of thing, and he falls on the side of the chicken. Uh, and while you might disagree with the larger uh, method or with the larger uh, claim, it's certainly open for debate. Uh, it is an outstanding introduction into into how to think about race in America. Uh, you know, one of the real insights that a lot of scholars of race have have brought and continue to be sort of hotly debated, but certainly is entering more into the mainstream is the notion that, you know, rather than thinking of African-Americans as sort of like the exception to this liberal trend in American politics, where we gradually fold more and more people into American democracy, right? Rather, uh, there's this notion instead that racism is kind of baked into the American soil. It's, it's woven into the, into the national fabric. Uh, and Kendi's book helps us to grapple with that. Um, another book uh, that I would definitely recommend for thinking about this particular moment, the particular a uh, crisis in the protests that we're in from a historical standpoint is a book called Occupied Territory mm-hmm. by a historian named Simon Balto, B-A-L-T-O. And it's about the city of Chicago, but it's particularly about its police uh, in terms of race. Uh, and it starts uh, in a so-called Red Summer of 1919 after the World War I when there's a big uh, sort of a, a anti-communist hysteria uh, and it continues into the 1980s. Uh, and it's basically a history of Chicago's pol- uh, police department and its, and its uh, uh, use of, of racial discipline over the years. And he argues that you know, from, the, from its very beginnings, from its very origins, the Chicago Police Department has, uh, has always been designed to be a racial police force. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really speaks to a lot of the concerns of, of those on the ground today, those, those protests. Mm-hmm. But it's a very useful history book as well as a very important work of history. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so you also were involved in editing Goodbye Antura, which might be the only book of yours that people on this, on this Probably, Zoom yeah. are familiar with. Um, and I mean, what an, what an exciting book. I mean, with so many, I mean, such an interesting personal story uh, with the involvement of uh, Keith Wadenpah and Vartan Gorian. Uh, how did you get involved with that? What was your experience? What did it feel like to be involved in sort of writing Armenian history after dedicating yourself to the study of American history? Sure. So, uh, Carney Kwanman, the author of Goodbye Antura, this memoir of the Armenian genocide when he was a child, is the father of my aunt by marriage. So, my mother's brother's wife, uh, my Hori Tanti. Uh, so, she came to me. Uh, it was about, it was 2014, right? It was because it was a year before the, the 100th anniversary. And she's, and she had, uh, and her sister had recently commissioned a translation of this memoir, right? Which existed in two forms. One which was a very long form and one which was an edited form. One was at Hamas Kain and one was at Antelias. And uh, anyway, they, had, they, 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 she showed me the translation. She's like, I'd like to publish it as a book. And she, it was just sort of a abstract idea in her head. She's like, can you look at it and see if that's possible? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I read through. It's really sort of full of these incredibly uh, descriptive passages, and it's a tragic story, but it's also the story of resilience and, and another lens into the Armenian genocide. And I thought that it had, that there was the potential for it. But it was also really long. It had a lot of repetitive passages. It wasn't even really written like a book in the original draft that she showed mm-hmm. you. Uh, so I tried to just give it some sort of surface edits so that if she, she could take it to a publisher and they could see that it's something to look at. Um, and I also just, you should probably find a historian who can provide an introduction that will provide some good context. Uh, and that's how we, it ended up ultimately with Keith Wattenbaugh, uh, who wrote this wonderful introduction, but also took it to Stanford University Press, uh, which was not either I or my Hori Tantik was expecting. Uh, and they were really interested. Uh, but they said, first of all, it's, you know, of course, it's, it's sort of this sprawling thing that needs to be condensed and brought together. Uh, but we want to bring it up for the 100th anniversary, the recognition of the 100th anniversary of the genocide, which gave me about five or six weeks <laughs> to cut it down. Uh, so that was one of the great challenges, of, you know, just in terms of time. Um, yeah. So I was, you know, of course, I'm not, I'm not the expert on the genocide, Keith is. Um, and so I was really sort of just the word person, right? It was taking all these sections and figuring out what goes with what, uh, cutting out repetitions, trying to turn it into a, into a coherent, uh, book. Like, there was one chapter that was maybe 60 pages long, and the next chapter was five pages long. So trying to make that consistent along the way, mm-hmm. and each tell us. It was just more of like a, a, 
a writing challenge for my part, for my part mm -hmm. than kind of the historian. Uh, but it brought in some interesting uh, dynamics, like some, you know, on the one hand, there was my Huri Tanti, and her father was her great hero. And mm -hmm. so she took everything that was in that book as kind of a gospel truth, even though he was writing the story, remembering from when he was five to the 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and Keith, who was, who was saying, well, look, the train that she, that he's saying he was on, there's no way that it went from that city to that city because the train line didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, we're always sort of, there was this process, whenever we came across some kind of historical discrepancy, it was always this fascinating back and forth that I was in the middle of. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, and it's a memoir, so of course it's not literal truth, right? Uh, anyone, <laughs> those the people who've read it, right? They, they can't take it as sort of, it, ex it happened exactly as it did. But a memoir can speak to sort of a larger truth, right? And I, and I, I think this one does. I hope it does. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I'm just going to ask one and a half more questions. Then I want to open it up for questions from everyone else, because I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. Um, one question um, is, I mean, it seems like, you know, and we're seeing more and more, especially with the publication of Angela Davis's book, that there's a clear and direct relationship between support for Palestinians and support for the human rights of African Americans. Um, and this, that this relationship has lasted for quite some time. Um, and I'm curious, I, as a historian, I always hate it when people ask me this question, so I apologize in advance, but uh, why do you think the same kind of uh, relationship doesn't exist between Armenians and, or Armenian Americans and support for African American human rights? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, Until recently, let's say. <laughs> yeah. In the past couple of weeks, we've seen a big shift in conversations, right. but... It's quite new, aside from a couple, you know, it's individual uh, people. Right. Well, you know, the question of Palestine and the civil rights movement is, is really a fascinating question, too, because uh, for so much of the of the movement, it had so such strong Jewish support. Uh, right? So many of the white civil rights activists, uh, and so many of the financial backers of the civil rights movement uh, were Jewish. And so there was this association of, of, Jew, of Jewish Americans and African Americans that was very strong theme in the 50s uh, and 1960s. And then with the Yom Kippur War in 1967, you start, it's right around the time when black power is emerging as this uh, very visible ideology and, and a rallying slogan for many African Americans. And so black power activists like Stokely Carmichael, later someone like Angela Davis, right, become outspoken proponents uh, of, of Palestine. They say, they liken the sort of, because black part of the ideology of black power often is to liken African Americans to colonial subjects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and thus Palestine, it provides this um, uh, historical or this political parallel that becomes valid. That also is at the cost of losing much of the Jewish support that had been so, such a uh, central element of the civil rights movement. I don't know how to answer your question about Armenian Americans and <laughs> Palestinians. Um, I think you, you, I don't do, you know, you know the answer to this much better than I do. Do you think that Armenians tend to see themselves as a colonized people in the same way? Uh, some, I think some do, but it's not, there's not, I mean, basically the question of human rights with regards to the, to, to Armenians is specifically about the genocide, right? And then the, mm -hmm. the lack of recognition of the genocide. So it's kind of like a human rights issue from the past that, you know, it's not this, obviously, the temporally, it's quite different to, um, to issues related to Palestinians. Um, but I'm not sure if Armenians would see the history of the genocide specifically in relation to uh, colonialism or imperialism. Right. I think when people do make those kinds of connections to another people, right, no matter what, I don't mean this in, a, in such a cynical way, but it's always in their, they see it as in their self-interest to do so, right? They see it as right. a political tool for themselves. So maybe the question is, why don't Armenian Americans see that as an effective Right. tool to ally themselves with Palestinians, right? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Pedros, are there, do you want to switch to, I mean, I can keep asking questions, but if people have questions, let's I turn to let's, them. Let's open it to the general audience now. And you can write your name and uh, on the chat box and we can take uh, the questions one by one. Uh, do you want people to actively participate via uh, uh, video or just questions? How do you think, Rachel? It's up to you, Adam. Yeah, let's, yeah. Whatever, whatever's best for you guys. Let's let people Whatever. talk. Yeah, let's see people's faces. Yeah, let's see people. Real. Let's write your name yeah. so that we have a, we have a, a order of questions. Or they can raise their hands too, but maybe yeah, not everyone. Introduce yourself to. and open your video and then we can start the, uh, the, uh, the questions. 
but please write on the chat box your name so we can start the conversation. If you open your uh, video, it means you are going to ask a question. So, I'll I'll start I'll start with the question. Yes, but introduce Shant yourself, please. It's Shant Martirosian. Shant Martirosian, yes. And uh, and 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 Adam, I, I wanted to also just mention that I produced the uh, documentary film "They Shall Not Perish," which was in in part um, uh, uh, related to uh, Garnick's uh, uh, memoir as well at the, at, at his state in the Irish Relief Orphanage. Um, so I think I wanted to mention that uh, the, the reason I think that some Armenians identify more with the Palestinian cause than with the African-American uh, struggle is because many of them, uh, like myself, uh, came from the Middle East and, and, and mostly from Arab countries. And so there was that, that connection. Uh, and they did. there is a connection where uh, our histories are similar in terms of having lost the homeland, ethnic cleansing. So I think, I think there is more identification there than there is the path that um, the African-American community came from, which was th more through, through the, the, the path of being enslaved and um, uh, the struggle here in the US for the civil rights movement. So I just wanted to make that comment in, in my observation, because I've had that same question and, and have thought about that myself as to why why, do, why doesn't the Armenian American community connect more with the African American community for the, for the similar struggles? Sean, thank you for that. Um, first, and first of all, let me say thanks for the, uh, uh, for the film, right, which was really an important step in Carnegie's story being uh, told to a larger audience. I, I know that, that the film uh, you used many of his quotes and, 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 and was uh, often centered around him. Uh, so yeah, my deep appreciation for that. Um, I think you're right. I think, and I think I see some of the questions in the chat as they're popping up, uh, connecting to the, also the issue of sort of uh, thinking about the sometimes the lack of Armenian Americans identification with the African American struggle, uh, and how that might revolve also around issues of whiteness. Right? Uh, many of you know the article how Armenians became white, uh, and have, you know there's a couple landmark court cases in the early 20th century. Uh, in which uh, the judicial system uh, in Oregon and Massachusetts wrestled with the question of, are Armenians white? Right? Um, and it speaks to the idea of, of whiteness being this very flexible, some almost uh, abstract category in a lot of ways, right? Uh, but, the, but the largest definition of what a white person is, is not a black person, right? And, and so it speaks to, there's a particular American construction of whiteness that is biracial in nature. Uh, and that has been often, you know, leaves a lot of room for confusion in terms of thinking about Asian Americans, for instance, or people from Southeast Asia, or Armenians, right, who were classified as Asiatics in the early, uh, or in the late 19th century and early 20th century, in the same time when there were categories on your census that you could check that were Celt or Hebrew or Slav or things that we don't think of as races now, but people thought of as races at the time. So race itself is this very flexible category. Uh, and that can help to think about the flip side of, your, of, of what you're saying, and that's why fewer Armenian Americans might tend to identify with the African-American struggle because a lot of the uh, Armenian-American progress has been built on claiming the privileges of whiteness, right? Despite discrimination that Armenians have faced, they've also been able to be white. Thank you. Garine Isasi, where are you? Hi, this is Garine. Um, hi. hi, thank you so much for having this webinar. This is really interesting. Um, I'm, I wrote a novel about the rise of rap music in the United States, and there's Armenian connections in my book just because I can't help it because I'm Armenian. But one of the things I've noticed is that in my, in my research and talking to a lot of African Americans, what we have as Armenians is sort of a genetic memory of oppression and racial profiling. Like somewhere in our background from our grandparents or our even our parents, if we had uh, a lot of people came from Cyprus or from Lebanon or from other places or, or from Istanbul later on, not during the genocide, but later, we were, we were profiled the way that African Americans are profiled as, a, as something different, you know, as the oppressed. We were oppressed. So can you elaborate on the concept of 
you know, it, it kind of goes back to that, why don't we connect to the African American community in the same way when, you know, there's a connection there that has to do with that feeling of being oppressed that's passed down to us from our grandparents. That's a, that's a, that's an interesting counter, right, to, to the notions of Armenians as as gaining from the privileges of whiteness. And I think there is something there. Uh, your the comments made me think about my uh, the, my earlier conversations with those other two Armenian Americans who became his, uh, African American historians. While we all had really different paths and different ways in which we got to there, in different ways, I think we all identified w uh, with an underdog story or with or with the, with the story of those who you know of looking out for those who had been marginalized, right? And, and maybe that's just, you know, uh, grew out of our earlier experiences and how we thought about history based on our, our lives as Armenians, right? Um, that there was this, you know, they were always constantly made as an other, right? And at the same time, the, again, just to sort of balance that, I think it's important to consistently put forth that balance, right? Armenians were able to get access to legal rights, uh, to own homes in uh, in, in white-only neighborhoods, to, uh, to to bank loans, to, to all sorts of uh, policies and and privilege and like not cultural privileges but political and economic privileges that African Americans were denied. Right? Um, each goes through this incredible watershed moment, right? One in terms of the genocide, the other in terms of slavery, right? And those are very different historical processes yeah, no. uh, that will connect, but also show the distinctions. <laughs> Thank you. The other aspect of it, as, as someone, um, Adam, you live in Memphis, right? So what are there, like seven Armenians in Memphis? <laughs> I grew up in we'll Houston, <laughs> right? Like, you know, I grew up in Houston, so I was always considered the other. Like, I was the mm -hmm. exotic ethnic person, you know, in right. my high school. So I identified, I even among the white people, and I was considered white, quote unquote, I was still not considered white by white people growing up right i was not i was just something weird like i was often in texas especially i was often mistaken for mexican mm -hmm. you know which is just as just as weird <laughs> in that respect so you know that's one of those things where in the northeast where there's a large number of armenians you could kind of live in your enclave but if you lived anywhere else besides glendale or boston or maybe new jersey it was hard. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, Mark. Mark Yagjian. Where are you? <coughs> Mark. Hi. Th thank you. I'm, I'm really learning a lot here. Um, I think um, the, the question's already been touched on, but I, basically I was curious about what uncomfortable truths should Armenian Am Americans acknowledge and discuss amongst ourselves about um, our roles in white privilege. I know um, I've become you know, much more aware of the privileges I've had, uh, but um, had not really heard those, those conversations before. I, I did have some appreciation for doors that were open to me that weren't open to other minorities, specifically blacks, but um, I hadn't really heard um, our Armenian Americans acknowledge that, and they tend to rely on the American uh, myth of rugged individualism, and that we were, um, you know, impoverished um, Im immigrants who pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, but um, ignore or don't acknowledge the fact that we cut, sort of cut in line with some folks who are here before us. Thank you, Mark. Yep. That's a good uh, question. And um, I think one thing that we, can, that we can do is we don't have to necessarily think of this as an either or question, right? Either, our, our means are either immigrants who are, who are rugged individualists who pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and worked hard to achieve the progress they did and also faced you know, all, all sorts of oppression based on their ethnic identity. They can do that and still also benefit from whiteness, right? Um, and and that and that's the larger case. Um, you know, if you're if you have access to whiteness, then when the federal housing authority is is you know, in, by starting in the 1930s and 1940s, it's it's creating you know, sort of a federal programs so that you can have a, a mortgage, self-amortized mortgage, so that more and more people can buy homes. 
but what are the neighborhoods in which they refuse to insure homes? Right, of course, the so-called practice of redlining. It's in, it's in uh, black. <laughs> so access to home ownership is, is just sort of one example of this. Uh, neighborhoods that are policed, people who are convicted of crimes and, and, and put into jail at disproportionate numbers for the same crimes tend to be African-American, right? So just as a couple examples of sort of the ways that the state works, the way that the, the, the larger political institutions work to uh, privilege whites over others, right? Um, that can happen at the same time that you can be, have faced oppression and have, and have pulled up your family over a course of generations to the status that many African, that many Armenian Americans enjoy today. Thank you. Or, uh, or, uh, Colleen, do you have a question or was just a statement? Um, hi, I'm Colleen. Well, I, I think the conversation's veered in another direction, but I just want to see if, um, you know, there, there is an awareness among the Armenian community that we have been colonized just by virtue of those borderlines being, um, being mis I think, misdrawn. And, you know, whether awareness of that would, would help us understand that we are sort of an oppressed people who should be aligning ourselves with uh, and fighting for the rights of other oppressed people. Or I wonder if that's just not a conversation within the general community. Um, I don't know how to answer the question specifically. Uh, I do think that in that no matter what, we should be thinking about you know what are the ways in which we can you know as as progressive uh, Armenian Americans, what are the ways in which we can use our history to <coughs> progressive causes, right? Uh, and the lang and the language that you're using and the and the uh, historical examples that you're bringing up are powerful ways to do so. Um, so a lot of it is about, you know, sort of claiming the, claiming the public narrative, claiming the historical narrative, uh, and groups like this can do that. Uh, thank you, Ara. Uh, Elise, Elise Yusufian, Yusufian, where are you, Elise? Are you uh, hello, Elise, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this talk, and I'm just, I'm, I'm filled with wonder at the kind of flowering of Armenian consciousness that between all the, the articles in Armenian Weekly, for example, and different gatherings focused on racial prejudice. And now here we are tonight. I've been attending and reading everything I can because I really didn't think any of you were out there. <laughs> I thought I was alone in having questions and seeking to be in solidarity um, and seeing our, our histories uh, reflected in the suffering of others um, as well as the ways we've been you know unconsciously or not um, complicit and <laughs> and so I just saw the, the comment thank you <laughs> um, and so one of the most profound moments that I had in the week after George Floyd's murder and there were many I imagine for all of us and for many more people um, was seeing comments from some Armenians on social media that were expressing, uh, expressing a vast amount of anti-Black uh, sentiment and attitudes. And none of that was new to me. I'd, I'd heard it my whole life, but it had always been a mystery to me because I'm firstborn US in my generation. So like, how, I mean, in my, in my family. So how did, this, how did this come to pervade our consciousness? Was one of the questions I've had for a long time. Um, but also, one of the comments I saw, I'm just gonna say it, it's not the worst, but it, it, it was someone saying, quote, where were the- Quote, unquote, say, quote, unquote. Oh yes, okay, the comment, quote, <laughs> um, where were the blacks when, a uh, hundred years ago, unquote. <laughs> and it blew my mind, the, the, the layers of, of kind of, twist like distortion of information and his lack of knowledge of history all wrapped up in this one little comment and i'm very very interested in offering something better <laughs> um but i just i don't with something like that i don't even know where to start and i'm wondering <laughs> i'm wondering um if it's even worth it because I generally tend to put my focus in spaces where people are interested and curious to learn and not where I have like no chance <laughs> um, but I'm very interested in disrupting that because I just ugh. 
anyway, so any, any insights or anything that you can offer, um, I would be really happy for. Sure. Well, in terms of social media strategies, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, depending on the person you're, you're dealing with and the, and the conversation that you're in, like, I don't, I'm, I'm not the one to say engage in all those conversations. Like when my mother-in-law posts something racist and idiotic, I just let it go. I don't want to amplify what she's saying. Uh, and, uh, and I, I, because I feel like I'll just contribute to the problem rather than, rather than solve the problem. Uh, that said, if I feel like it's a productive conversation to be a part of mm -hmm. with buddy, then I try to engage in those conversations. And to, the, to that question, and this is kind of a common sort of reactionary uh, trope that we're seeing while I got comment, but the, the notion behind it is sort of that white people have brought black people up over the years, right? Otherwise, they'd just all be in villages in Africa, and, and that would be it, right? Uh, so where were black people 100 years ago? They were in the after effects well, of... <laughs> Of slavery, they were living in a, in a Jim Crow society. There were there were laws put in a place that were explicitly designed to keep black people from voting. There were people who were when they stepped out of the race were lynched. Uh, there was laws that physically segregated blacks and whites. Right, that's where black people were hundred years ago. Who changed that? Black people. Right. <laughs> uh, so that story of African American history is one that we can keep illuminating. Right. Uh, oppressed people change their have to change their circumstances and have to force the rest of the society to do so. We're seeing that in this moment, right? On you know, the flip side of that is think about how many more people are talking about race in a more open and understanding way, white people, right, uh, in 2020 than they were in 2015. I'm not even, uh, this isn't sort of generational. This is just over the, you know, these these moments have accumulated, starting with the Trayvon Martin case, and then the Ferguson case, and then the election of Donald Trump. And, and so, like, it's, it's, it's snowballed to the point where people who I would never would have thought of, like, as showing any sympathy at all to the to African American issues, to aligning themselves with these causes, are doing so, and people who had been sort of, in general, sort of in favor of uh, of, of racial reforms, are now putting themselves on the line and, and becoming more politically active in ways they had. So, this is a really unique. Like we'll look back on this as a as a historical moment. I'm not sure I'm not sure what direction it's going. I, I don't can't predict the future. I'm really bad at that. Um, but it's but it's a moment for sure. Oh, sure. Th thank you. thank you for that. I know other people have questions. I just wanted yeah, to throw in. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just want, if I can, I just wanted to throw in really, really quick. Thank you. And everything that you just said, I'd already been trying to bring forth and it just went nowhere. And so <laughs> it, that's, that's what's so painful and hard. Um, and, and still this gives me hope. Thank you. Thank you. Pedrosian, uh, where are you? Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Rachel. It's very good to see you again. Um, I have uh, two your, brief questions. Oh, uh, uh, hi. I'm Alex, Alex Bedrosian. Oh, yes. Alex Bedrosian. I live in Washington, D.C., practicing law. Um, Professor Agustusian, uh, first, I'm, I'm very curious to hear your view on Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, because, as we know, his uh, ideology of self-determination led him to propose the big state for the Armenians in Western Armenia, and this makes him a hero to Armenians. But that ideology of self-determination uh, originated from a racist belief that different ethnicities can't live together, and that's why he was a horrible segregationist in the United States. So I would be incredibly curious. Uh, I've thought about writing about this myself, but I, I, I really love your opinion. As an Armenian American his professor of African American history, uh, what is your opinion overall on Woodrow Wilson? Uh, the second question, very briefly, uh, a very prominent member of the Armenian community here in Washington, DC, uh, once said uh, that he predicted that the Armenian diaspora has a hundred years left. And after that, it's, it's finished because of all the intermarriage, all the assimilation. Um, and so I, I guess my question is, how can Armenians uh, of the diaspora be good uh, allies and not stand in the way of diversity and promote anti-racism? Uh, while still uh, preserving our own existence and resisting ruthless assimilation. Thank you all. Sure. 
to the first question uh, regarding Woodrow Wilson, I think it's a really good question, and the, and I'd encourage you to, to think about writing about something about that that connects the Armenian question to his notions of segregation at home. I think that's that's a really valuable insight. Um, I mean, Wilson was without question uh, racist in terms of his beliefs. He grew up in Virginia. Uh, he was an armed segregationist. Uh, there was a, a retra uh, there was a retrenchment in terms of federal policy on race during his time in office. Um, Stepping back from the from the more liberal policies of uh, his predecessors Theodore Roosevelt and, and William Howard Taft uh, is a guy who screened the movie Birth of a Nation in the White House uh, and talked about how it basically told a true a true story of uh, of, of a black uh, tyranny during Reconstruction um, and at the same time of course Wilson is a progressive president right he is the one who institutes all sorts of reforms that benefit American life in in all sorts of ways that tame the worst. Uh, the sharpest edges of capitalism that uh, he institutes the uh, the Federal Reserve, child labor laws, um, a whole host of things that I'm forgetting right now. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, as a as a his, as a historian, we we I tr very much try to avoid the the question of putting someone into the good and the bad category, right? He's a human being. He is, he's full of flaws. He has, there are many aspects of his policies that are visionary in terms of his. Uh, vision for what a post-war peace could look like. He has a lot of limitations in terms of his political ability to, to get that through. Uh, he is progressive in ways that are that are very significant, and he is regressive in ways that are significant. Um, I, I, I think as long as we can, can contextualize Wilson and can, and can understand him both for his, uh, his uh, contributions to American democracy and his um, and his limitations in that regard, then we have to, as historians, tell as complete a story as we can. Uh, to your second question, I don't think, I, I would say that's a, it's just an inaccurate statement to say that someone can be assimilating into, into American life and not hold on to their Armenian identity. I just, I just reject the very assumption that we have to remain somehow ethnically pure to continue to claim our Armenian identities, right? We, we all are Armenians here in, in different ways. We have different experiences. So I just, I just reject the very idea. I don't know what else to say about it. Thank you, Aura. Uh, the other question is uh, Jennifer B. Do you have a question or? Um, yeah. Are you? Oh, hi. Hi, Jennifer Berenson here. Um, yeah, so part of the what I was writing was a question of, given the lack of empathy that we do see among many um, Armenians, um, for African Americans today, and I'm really heartened by the people that who are writing about it, the things that have been in the Armenian Weekly and some other things as well. But when you see sort of the backlash comments from many Armenians, it's it's of course very disheartening. Um, so the so I guess the question is, what cultural institutions within the Armenian community can reach the non-academics? I mean, we have this problem as well. I'm a college professor here in Southwestern Virginia. We have um, right in front of the college, not technically on our property, a Confederate mon monument that was put up in about 1910 by the Daughters of the Confederacy. And uh, the local uh, people around here don't wanna hear what those, you know, uh, liberal academics from other places have to say. And so there's a similar tension between you know the academic community and the non-academic community. So I guess, I mean, these sorts of forums are great, but in a sense, this is the choir. Um, are other Armenian institutions, cultural institutions on board with bringing a greater level of education and understanding to you know, the non-academic Armenians? What, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I don't know about the particular institutions. I think those are questions that I think that we can take and, and wherever we are, and we can take those to other institutions that might be receptive to those ideas. Uh, I think I saw that you posted an op-ed that you'd written, is that correct? I think yeah, I did. Other ways in which we can do it, like to talk about Confederate monuments, for instance. When I came to Memphis 16 years ago, we had this big statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Plant in the, in the heart of Memphis. I was part of this sort of like young leader group when I first came, and they asked us uh, where you stand on this issue. Do you think it should be removed no matter what? I was the only one out of this group, maybe 20 young, smart, mostly liberal professionals who thought that we should just get rid of it. 
And then the conversation changed. We chipped away at it, right? And, and uh, same kinds of things. I was writing op-eds in the paper, going to city council meetings to testify on this issue. And at first people thought it was like a, a voice in the wind, but it, it accumulated over time. And not that every political cause is gonna do so, but you know, in these moments, we often get really idealistic. We think, how can we change everything, right? But history shows us a lot of times, there are those moments when everything changes, there are these truly revolutionary moments, but there are also plenty of movements where we're just chipping away. Um, and so it's organization by organization, individual by individual. So that's the my sort of larger way that I would think about it. Can I ask a quick follow up? Sure. I was just wondering whether when Armenians first started coming here early 20th mm -hmm. century, um, were they in competition among local black communities for jobs and housing and other sorts of things that might have exacerbated tension between the communities? Um, there might be others who, who can answer that question in, in a more informed way than, than me, but I would say that in general, you know, the Armenian wave of migration, of course, starts in the 1890s and continues through the early 20th century. It's, it predates most of the major black migration to American cities, which really starts okay. around World War One, just to sort of the larger immigration is getting choked off. Um, so direct competition, it could exist, uh, but, but the Armenian experience in that way is sort of a, sort of a working class rising up is similar to a lot of ethnic groups, right? Bohemians and Slavs and all these other uh, Italians and all these other groups that are sort of grabbing onto to whiteness, access to things like labor unions that, that African Americans are denied to. Uh, African Americans become strike breakers often. Um, in, the, in those situations. So again, the sort of the privileges of, of whiteness uh, are ways in which they're able to, uh, you know, being white means not being black in other words, and Armenians are able to hold on to that. Thank you. Uh, the other question is from uh, Professor Wilson Fall, Lafayette College. Uh, where are you, uh, Professor, where are you? Are you here? I was actually mm -hmm. trying to oh, hi. You but I see it still. Okay, I like it. So, um, this has been a really interesting um, discussion and I'm very happy to be here and very happy to hear the professor uh, talk about his books and uh, very heartened uh, by the discussion that's going on. My question was about um, uh, uh, um, something that was submitted to the United Nations in 1951. I know because my aunt was one of the people who worked on it. And that was the paper, We Charged Genocide. <clears throat> I think that the United States is so complicated, as you were saying, and the history is so layered, and the ident identities and histories of Black people have been so compressed that it's hard to know that they're actually sub-histories uh, in that, in that uh, larger history, that larger narrative. I was, I was just wondering whether you think that um, those accusations or that perception uh, after World War II of genocide of African Americans is, a, is an idea that might uh, be of interest or help people uh, in the Armenian community understand some of the itinerary of uh, African Americans. That's a really fascinating question. Uh, you know, you mentioned this uh, petition or this uh, publication before the United Nations. We charge genocide. William Patterson and these other African Americans who were considered radicals uh, of their era, right? Uh, and we're, we're about to start getting blacklisted. It's the early Cold War. Um, I've always, you know, and so your idea of subhistories is maybe an interesting way to approach this issue because. The larger dominant historical process for African Americans, I don't think has been one that it can be that is effectively characterized as genocide. And that's not a that's not a uh, value judgment, right? It's more that the larger historical process of African Americans has been one of exploitation of their labor and of their resources and of their bodies, right? Um, that's it's not to systematically remove them; it's to exploit them. For uh, that's been the larger history. That said, there are genocidal aspects to instances within African American history, the sub-histories uh, that, that you speak to, right? If you think about the raft of a rash of lynchings in the 1890s and early 1900s, one example is uh, the racial violence that explodes at the end of World War I with the Great Migration. You think of places like Tulsa, Rosewood, and so on, right? Um, in which there are you know, mass deaths in, in that regard. Um, so 
should I mean, so should the notion of genocide for the African American experience be used as a way to garner Armenian American support? I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable with that as, as the right, because I've yeah, I'm paradigm. seen that, that there are these two important watershed moments that in some ways connect African American history, Armenian American history, right, in terms of the Armenian genocide and the larger slavery and exploitation of African Americans. But they're also really distinct historical processes of the right. same. Um, so I, I just, I'd, I'd approach it with uh, caution, I guess. Is the right. So, so it wouldn't be a sufficient hook. I guess to me, for example, those conditions that seemed to spell genocide at the time mm -hmm. went in a direction that people didn't anticipate. So mm -hmm. you can no longer say right. that. Mm -hmm. But I was more thinking about whether people, whether that might be interesting to people that at one point, African Americans did think that they were going to be totally wiped out. That is interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's something that has popped up in African American politics and culture over, over the time. Uh, in fact, like for instance, like the, the uh, post Roe v. Wade, there was a movement among some African American radicals against abortion because they saw it as a way to, that was gonna be designed to systematically destroy the African American community. So that's a, that's a rhetorical uh, tool that's been used right. in various moments in African American history as well. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. One more question. Does anyone have a question before we? Uh, yes, I yeah, I'm, mine, mine was kind of a question, but also a remark for the introduce yourself, yeah, I'm first. Uh, my name is Geram Mournetan. Uh, uh, I, I just, um, I'm, I live in Los Angeles. I'm the archivist at the uh, Institute of Armenian Studies at USC. Uh, my, uh, the comment for the pr previous question about uh, shared experiences is that the large community that I worked with and collected oral histories are displaced persons. These are Armenians who came to United States after World War II. These are Soviet Armenians who were forcefully taken to Germany and were forced labor in Germany, who survived camps in Germany. But when I was getting oral histories from them, also expressed very racist feelings about their neighbor. These are people who live in Montebello, uh, in the in suburb of Los Angeles, but expressed very serious uh, racist feelings about their own neighbors, you know, other minorities they live around. And even to say, even if not the genocide, quit, these are people who had gone through the same experience, who had been taken out of their birthplaces and their labor was exploited literally in forced labor camps by the Nazis, who had survived the Nazis, but vehemently believed themselves to be Aryans and look at everybody else from that uh, mountain, basically. And express those and you, you uh, astonishment of how people gone through that experience. It's not even a generation removed. These are the same people who have gone through it. It's not that their children are racist. They themselves were. And it was astonishing as to, and I couldn't comprehend it. I, st I still, uh, I can't as much. How does that happen? How does a person having gone through that experience uh, do that? replicate that well i think um it's, it's a really that's it's a fascinating story and uh, i've just learned recently about this uh, migration from from the camps and it's it's uh, it's such an interesting aspect of armenian american history uh so i thank you for illuminating it. and your question is, is such a or is such an important one um i think in some ways it speaks to you know those who are sort of on the edge those who have been so vulnerable to prejudice and, and racism uh, uh, often tend to be those who you know are in the most insecure status and thus are the most are sort of the do the work of racism in, ter in that sense more so than the elites who have the distance from it right um, when you think just in terms of the larger context of, of American of American political history uh, in the 1970s when there's this white backlash against the civil rights movement and and Richard Nixon is capitalizing on a so-called silent majority who is he going after? It's, it's it's not the the Republicans in, in office towers in New York City, right? He's he's recruiting new members of the Republican Party through white ethnics, right? Who are who had been historically voted Democrat because they were you know working class, and now are voting on race lines, right? Are seeing the Democratic Party as the, as the party of uh, that does favors for black people and doesn't care about uh, about 
whites, and so they feel insecure in their status, and thus gravitating toward the toward these reactionary politics. Um, so that's maybe a less extreme version of of, of the of the of the very powerful story that you're telling. Cool. Thank you, Aram. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for this excellent conversation. I think we learned a lot from. Uh, your ideas, your uh, b background, your historical analysis, and the way in which Armenian Armenians in general should perceive or understand the uh, African American history, and instead of becoming more uh, alienated, actually embrace it as part of, you know, as as part of a people that have that has su suffered and still suffering, meaning uh, African Americans. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to let you know that I'm putting the our. I uh, just uh, sending you our Facebook page, Society for Armenian Studies. I highly encourage you to become members, supporters of the Society for Armenian Studies. Email me if you want to do so. We have a fascinating project, and I just want to announce that we have uh, we were going to announce two uh, grants, minor grants that deals with race uh, and Armenian history. How can we benefit the lit from the literature that has been written about? African Americans from race perspective, and how can that benefit uh, uh, Armenian studies? Uh, we're going to announce it next week. Uh, so please follow our Facebook page. Uh, we have excellent uh, uh, lectures coming up next month. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. And thank you, Aram. And again, thank you, Rachel, for this excellent, excellent uh, session. Good night, thank everyone. You, Aram. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. I was honored to do it. Thank, Thank you. you.